Good morning, everyone. We're coming up on the last week of OCB 2021. My name is Heather Benway. I'm a senior research specialist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the executive officer of the Ocean Carbon and Biogeochemistry or OCB project office. I am an oceanographer with interests in paleoceanography and marine biogeochemistry. OCB is a bottom-up program. For those of you who are new to OCB, um, this means that the leadership and activities of OCB are really shaped by its network through an open process. We, we issue annual solicitations for OCB activity proposals, and our leadership is done through an open nomination process. I want to welcome you all today. It's been really exciting to have, we had about 800 people register for this workshop. So we've had a subset of those people. And I, I, I imagine, we haven't looked at the data yet, but I imagine it's been a, a different subset of people each and every day, um, depending on the session and the content of the day. So it's been really great, um, especially wonderful to have so much international engagement in our workshop this year. We usually do this meeting in Woods Hole at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, so we can only fit about 200 people in our conference room. So it's really terrific to, to be able to make the best possible use of this online platform called ePoster Boards. I just wanna start off by thanking a lot of people and groups and federal agencies that make the OCB program and all of its activities possible, that have made this workshop possible. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank our sponsors um, for the OCB project office. NSF and NASA have, have provided sustained funding for the OCB project office since its inception. Um, I want to thank our physical host, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which provides great resources for our project office, as well as, as hosting capabilities for all of our large meetings, some of our large meetings, not all of them. I want to thank our event hosts this year, ePoster Boards, which is an amazing platform. I highly recommend it. A big shout out to, to Mike and Chase and, and Catherine Philippi, who you're going to meet for the first time today. I want to thank the OCB Scientific Steering Committee and the, and the session chairs for putting these fantastic plenary sessions together this year. I want to thank our speakers. Um, hopefully you've all had a chance to look at the talks that are online and, in, and you're enjoying this format where we, we, we do our homework and watch the pre-recorded talks first and then we have the opportunity to really discuss and talk to each other, which is really what this meeting is all about. I want to thank Mae Mahegan and Mary Zawoski, who are my team members in the OCB project office and who have really helped make this meeting come together for everybody. And most importantly, I want to thank you all for coming. That's what makes the meeting, right? I want to provide, so if you want to learn more about OCB, I can't go into a lot of detail today, but just, just visit our website. It's right up here on the top. It's very easy to, to navigate to. Um, we're also on Twitter, and there's a hashtag for our workshop right here. Um, I want to start with a, a short land acknowledgement, and I, I encourage you all to be thinking about a land acknowledgement for wherever you are tuning in from. So this workshop was planned while working on the ancestral lands of the Wampanoag Nation, made up of the Mashpee, Aquina, and Herring Pond tribes. We honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples that are still connected to this land and the lands of our participants. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the substantial traditional and local knowledge that indigenous people hold and sustain. There is um, an orange button that you're going to notice on the ePoster Boards platform. I want to make sure that you're aware of this orange button. Um, that will take you to the code of conduct page on the OCB website. And from that code of conduct page, there is an incident reporting form. It's an anonymous form. If OCB does not tolerate any form of harassment, bullying, intimidation, or discrimination in any form, we encourage you to have open, respectful conversations, discussions, critiquing ideas, not people. If anybody feels that they are have experienced something that is not in line with OCB's code of conduct, or if they witness any behavior that is not appropriate, I strongly encourage you to go to this code of conduct page and, and click on the incident reporting form. Just a brief, um, a brief overview of our space. I know Catherine's gonna provide a little bit more information um, 
We're going to be using all of our meeting spaces today, and that's what these big green buttons are all about. Um, these green buttons will take you to all of our individual meeting spaces. You probably came into the lobby today when you checked in. Um, that's where we also have our happy hours, by the way. Great place for informal interaction. There are couches and, and just different gathering spaces of different sizes. The breakout room is where we're having our plenary sessions today. We'll be, we'll be uh, forming some small groups um, after the introductory uh, slides by the session chairs and speakers. And we'll have small group discussions um, based on the talks that we watched before the meeting. There are actually specific questions on the whiteboards at each of those tables that you'll be addressing depending on which topic table you choose. All tables are labeled. I want to point out that there are eight floors to this space. Um, so if you are, you happen to, to be on floor one and um, the, in, the in situ measurement table is all, both tables are all um, filled up, then go up to floor two and see if you can find a spot there. Um, the lecture hall will be having some um, afternoon report out presentations today after the poster session. And um, so uh, you can go to there after the poster presentations. Um, in the poster hall, there is there are interactive poster presentations today. Um, this is the final day for posters. There are about 20 presenters um, and they will be on floors one and two. And then in the network area, today's our last chance for networking. All eight floors of that space have topical tables and, and groups for you to connect with. Um, floor one is for JEDI topics, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Floor eight is for early career community. And all the floors in between have a whole bunch of different topics. If you go to the networking directory, which will appear in one of these blue boxes, it will tell you where who is at what table and where. And um, I also wanna point out that the poster gallery has all of the posters and um, you can link to and watch any poster you want. There's, you, there's a recording that goes with each poster. So you can hear the posters in advance and then go to the interactive poster presentation and ask questions, you'll be all set to go. Um, so that will be actually open through August. So I highly recommend um, taking advantage of that. You can go to today's agenda and get a pop-up of just what's happening today. And you can always visit our workshop website from, from the navigation bar here. I also wanna point out that any boxes in, with the white are e-poster boards tutorials. And I also wanna encourage you, especially if you're joining for the first time today to watch the welcome video. It's only about five minutes long, but it really goes into detail about the OCB meeting spaces. Um, and, and provides a really nice overview of, of navigating the ePoster Boards platform. Let's see, have I forgotten any reminders? I know that Catherine's going to give you much more detailed, better information, so I'm going to let her do the rest. Um, so just to introduce you briefly to today, we're going to start with our plenary session, Optical Biogeochemistry Above and Below the Waterline. This is going to provide a really comprehensive glimpse of new and emerging optical technologies, including in situ, autonomous and satellite-based measurement approaches, merging multi-platform data sets from large field campaigns, one of which just happened, and integrating optical data and biogeochemical models. We'll have a short break, a short bio break after our two hour session. Um, and then you will be going into the poster sessions. Like I said, this is your last chance to see posters, stick to floors one and two, that's where they will all be. And then we'll all be coming back to the, the lecture hall for a couple of really important discussions. The first one will be a panel discussion. There will be a presentation followed by discussion and questions um, on the future of CO2 and seawater reference materials. Um, how are we going to prepare these materials and distribute them globally? Um, that's a really important community discussion, especially for the OCB community. So I really hope that we'll have a lot of engagement during this session. This is a topic that has to, has to be discussed and sorted out by this community over the next couple of years. Um, after that, Chris Sabine is going to share um, an overview of an international uh, vision document. Uh, you may have seen it. Um, I know the OCB uh, website and Twitter, we have um, 
gotten the word out about this and so have a lot of our partner programs. This is the Integrated Ocean Carbon Research Vision Document. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. And then we'll have our final networking session in the networking space. So I strongly encourage you to jump in, get involved and have a great day. I'm going to pass it off to Catherine Filippi now. She is the e-poster boards, one of our event operations managers. Thank you. Hi everyone and welcome. We're excited to be your host in this virtual conference software. There's a little bit of a learning curve with this software compared to a typical Zoom or Teams meeting. So we want you to know how to find us for tech help and we like to ask for patience and grace as everyone learns how to navigate the software since many of you are first time guests and presenters. Sorry for those of you have, who have logged in previously, but I will make this too um, cumbersome. Right now we are in the stage presentation mode and we're in the breakout room event space. The stage presentation takes over everyone's screen. So we will all see what's on stage regardless of what table that you're sitting at. If you are not a speaker, you can interact via the chat or the Q&A panel at the right of the screen. You can enter things into the Q&A anonymously, and you can click on items in the Q&A to upvote questions or comments you'd like to see featured or addressed by the speakers. Today, the program is split between several event spaces. Each event space has its own function and be aware of pop-up announcements directing you to the event spaces where activities will be taking place. For the upcoming session, we're gonna stay here in stage mode and bring a group of panelists onto the stage. They're going to go through a presentation and then issue a charge to breakout sessions. At that point, we're going to turn off the stage mode and return you to the table map mode. When we return you to the table map mode, you'll find that your icon is sitting at a table with others. You'll see icons filling seats on the map. Each icon represents a person, and each table is intentionally limited to the number of visible seats. You can move to a new table by double-clicking on any table with an open seat. If a table is full, then you won't be able to enter into that table unless someone leaves a seat for you to move into. During the sessions today, except for when we're on the stage as we are now, you can control your camera and microphone via the control panel at the bottom of the screen. We certainly encourage everyone to be, <clears throat> excuse me, an active participant and have cameras and microphones on to engage with others. Consider muting your microphone temporarily if you hear any audio feedback when others are speaking. Headphones are definitely encouraged to prevent audio feedback. Know that you're never stuck when you're in the software unless we're in stage presentation mode. We've put a link at the top of the general chat in this space and in the lecture hall in case you need to leave either space during the presentations. You can always return to the lobby where everything else is accessible. We encourage you to move around and meet as many people as possible and really have engaging conversations. During the poster session later today, there will be about 20 poster presenters who will be available and assigned to their virtual poster stations. Those are gonna be spread floors in the poster hall. Each presenter will be set up at their station and you'll see the presenter's name underneath their station. We only have about 45 minutes in that space, so please be sure to visit as many poster stations as you can and ask a lot of questions. Again, there's a designated number of seats per station and people will be moving around. So if you're waiting and a station is full, try visiting another author and then you can come back. If you really have been waiting for a while, then feel free to double click on a seat at the help desk and we can try to um, pop into a station to encourage people to move around. Definitely be an active participant, turn your video and camera on while you're viewing the posters. And many of the authors will be doing a live screen sharing of their poster presentations. And so when they are screen sharing, you'll see their slides pop up as a thumbnail. You can click it to enlarge. Also, other people will have their presentations on the whiteboard. When we're in the table mode in the poster hall, you'll see that in your bottom menu bar, there will be an icon for the whiteboard. And you can click that and view the embedded file. 
I also wanted to quickly talk about the chat feature. The general chat addresses everyone in the room. The table chat addresses everyone currently at the table with you. You can use the chat to search for individuals and send private messages, but please note that although private chat can go across floors and tables, they cannot go across rooms. So each room will have its own, own separate chat system. If you're in the lobby and send someone a message in the breakout room, that person will only see the message when they return to the lobby. So please keep that in mind. Throughout the event in all active event spaces, you'll be able to find ePoster Board staff if you need help. If you double click on an open seat at one of our help desks, we should be there to help. You can always know that if an ePoster Board technician, you'll see a star icon on top of our little circle icon. If you're having any trouble finding us on the higher floors, then please be sure to come down to the first floor and double click on the help desk. You can also search our name and then send us an individual chat message as well. One last comment, which is very important, refreshing your web page in your browser will resolve most technical glitches that happen with the software. So for example, if someone is doing a screen share and it freezes up, if you're not able to turn your camera and microphone on when you move between spaces, or if you're just having issues with moving between the tables, try refreshing and obviously make sure that you've logged in on the correct browsers, Chrome, Firefox, or Microsoft Edge. Again, you can always visit the help desk or send us a chat message if you need further troubleshooting instructions. I've covered a lot of information here, and in case you all didn't catch that, I want to remind you that we have the software tutorial video at the top of the screen. Now, you won't have access to any of the um, side panel buttons or the video while we're in the stage mode, but once we break out into the breakout activity, that's when you'll be able to see the table map and you'll be able to um, look at the video or utilize the information in the side panels. You can play the video at any time and return to it when it's convenient for you. Please make sure that you guys have fun and that you engage with others and you really take advantage of all the different activities that we have throughout the day. With that, we're going to go ahead and bring up the speakers for our next session. Thank you very much. All speakers, if you guys can please turn your camera and microphone on. Optics team, assemble. Move Okay, I think we're all here. Um, can everyone hear me? Just need some nods. Yeah. All right, welcome to the optical biogeochemistry session. So I'm one of the conveners. So um, introducing our suite of speakers today. If you didn't get a chance to look at their talks, please remember that these are stored online. You can get back to see them. Um, but the objective of this group was to, to look at new optical technologies, new um, missions that have been ongoing, these optical technologies together to create biogeochemical, biogeochemical um, proxies that we can then put into models. Um, so I'm Amy Maas, um, and I am one of the speakers. Seth and Maria worked with me on creating this session. Heather, can you advance the slide, please? All right, so when I'm talking about optical technologies, um, I'm talking about both images and also um, spectral data. And so I wanted to give everyone an idea of what it is that we are thinking about. There is a whole suite of instruments out there. Um, some of them are taking actual pictures. Some of them are getting um, hyperspectral backscatter. And all of this data then is used on a fair number of different platforms. They can range from satellites and uh, airplanes to just um, flow through systems on a boat, gliders, floats, um, they're pretty much being put on everything and of course just strapped onto a CTD. This is not a comprehensive list, but it, I want you, when you're thinking about optics, we're, this is what we mean when we're, we're talking about optics. Can I have the next slide, please? And so what you get from the type, these type of instruments is particles, okay? You get the size of the particles, how many you 
also sort of spectral data, which is giving you um, color and reflectance and a bunch of other information. And what this ends up looking like is you can get on your left hand plot, you're getting um, the size of a particle versus how many there are. On your right hand plot, you're getting wavelength versus reflectance. And when you're actually getting images, these are the kinds of images you get. So on your left hand side, those are ZOSCAN image. Bottom right, that's a UVP. And upper right, that's what you get from an IFCB. And so from these types of data, we're working on developing proxies that allow us to talk about pretty much everything. People are making proxies for everything. Um, but these data types, it's sometimes tricky to work with them together. And we're going to talk about sort of opportunities and difficulties with using, using these data to answer all the questions that we have. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, this is just a short session, but this is a large group of people who are interested in working on these topics. And so if you are interested in this, there's a couple things that I just wanted to draw your attention to. There are two town halls that are relevant to this. Um, so these are happening Friday. Look at those times and dates. Um, there's a group of... Um, a bunch of different projects working together all under the umbrella of Jetson, which has now been made a UN Ocean Decade program. If you're interested in Jetson, there's a an open meeting on the 29th. That's just next week. Take a check, uh, check it out on jetson.org. Um, and they also have a lot of links to other things. And this is very international, not just US. Everyone's loud. Um, and there's mentions of things there. Go BGC. Uh, there's registration for that open still. There is a new um, transatlantic pelagic imaging network that's opened up, and that first meeting is next week at Well. There's PACE applications, Open Optics course, deadline is done for this year. Tomcat, which is um, part of more of EU, um, is planning a low cost imaging summer course, hopefully next year, COVID, TBD. Um, and then the Ocean Optics Conference in fall 2020. So as you can see, there's a lot of people in a lot of places all thinking about this kind of data. And if you're interested in being involved, please, please do so. Um, with that, uh, next slide, we'll transition to Maria. Thanks, Amy. Hello, everyone. This is Maria Giorgio. From the second disc to the imaging flow cytobot, we've certainly come a long way over the past decades in using optical measurements to study aquatic environments, linking the color of the water to biogeochemistry, and actually going beyond that to study the ecology, uh, the biology of aquatic ecosystems from inland waters to the coastal zone to the vast open ocean. So for the rest of the session, we will first hear from our invited speakers, just a quick summary of the take home messages from their wonderful pre-recorded presentations. And our invited speakers will also highlight some important questions in their summaries, which we would like to discuss with all of you during our breakouts. First, we will start with Dr. Angel White, Associate Professor at the University of Hawaii and Director of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program. And we'll discuss some take home messages from her talk. Next slide, Heather, please. All right, thank you so much. Uh, this is a new platform uh, for me, so bear with me. Um, I was uh, asked to speak about utilization of in situ optical instruments uh, for hypothesis testing. Most of my work is focused on the open ocean, um, the below water part of this session. And I think one of the themes in thinking about this topic, and this has come across in all of the beautiful talks that you get to see, is just the explosion of optical oceanography in the last few decades as we're moving from multispectral to hyperspectral from armies of floats and full moorings and profiling wire walkers and gliders and these sensors are used for basic and applied science for proxies for um, products but also for hypothesis testing um, allowing us to really go a good bit further beyond biomass and more seamlessly blend our approaches with other approaches, omics, physical oceanography, wet chemistry onwards. So it's, it's really amazing to see all these papers that are addressing energy fluxes and particle fluxes and diodal vertical migration and community composition from a number of different perspectives. Um, in my own work, and I've talked about some of the approaches that we've used combining different imaging technologies to, to better understand the structure and the function of open ocean ecosystem and how who's there maps on to um, what you know, bulk uh, proxies are doing. It's, it's a big task. It's a lot to, to understand. 
um, some of the things that I've talked about in the talk is, is really honing in on mortality and loss using network modeling to identify pathways for trophic <clears throat> exchange. Um, but any of these cross-cutting approaches that are blending optics, optics with other technologies, they're always going to face with the real challenges of not just data integration, but I think a, a frank assessment of the uncertainties inherent to all of our approaches and how we can start to build trust in the proxies and products that are, are emerging. These are a few of the topics that we're going to be able to discuss in today's breakout. Um, next slide. So here are some questions that have collectively emerged from this, this first topic, you know, focused on in such in situ technologies and data sets, is really understanding what the major gaps are in the use of optical data sets to quantify the movement of carbon through ecosystems, what the standard suite of optical sensors are, um, what they should how they should be further incorporated into this rapidly expanding ocean observing platforms. Um, what should be targeted for future investment? And I think in this topic, we have to acknowledge that these um, are not yet democratic sensors. They can be quite expensive at times and, and hard to come by. Um, and then last, what is the, are the greatest technological hurdles as we move past A plus B equals C into you know, expanding our optical approaches in, in oceanography? With that, I think I'm turning it over to Ivona. Thanks. So, yeah, next speaker is Dr. Ivana Tetinik, biological oceanographer at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and also the NASA project scientist for the Experts Field Campaign Program. Ivana. Uh, yeah, I was <laughs> like, hi to everyone. I just broke my fingers and I'm pain meds. So if I don't make sense, um, I usually don't make sense, but I will make sense even more so. So really grateful to be invited um, to talk in this session. I was asked to talk about the power of optics um, that we can use to synthesize the knowledge in a large field campaigns and, you know, obviously exports, but also through my involvement in NABO8 and kind of like being in the field for some time, I assume I was a good person to do so. So um, one important stuff that optics brings us, it's, it's this, in a sense, artificial or direct, uh, bear with me, increase of the resolution of biogeochemical parameters. And, and artificially I'm saying, because for these simple optics instrument, the ones that deal with light, you know, we're using a physical um, instrument and we, you know, physical measurement, we combine it with biogeochemistry, develop proxy and increase that, you know, that resolution. And with imaging, um, those instruments are by themselves um, high frequency. And what that ultimately gives us in, is being able to study the, the processes of our interest, um, of the ones that we want to understand on a proper spatial temporal scale. We're not, we're not scavenging, we're not trying to spread out 300 you know, POC samples across the annual cycle. So that's really important. Um, and and with, with this increased resolution um, over the last decade or so, or even more so, we have seen explosion in the sense of these large field campaigns where people have really tried to seize that optics and, and kind of you know, confirm their hypothesis, the ones that Angelique was saying, but really also expand our knowledge, you know, like from some mesoscale to mesoscale, from, from you know, like uh, a week-long experiment to annual and so on. And in my talk, I really tried to kind of use everybody's work that I found along the way to kind of look into the idea of biological carbon pump and how, how much have we approved our knowledge about it just by focusing and using these optical tools to do the, the, the the systematic, the, this um, synthesis papers where, you know, people have used um, either aircraft-based observation combination with in situ data or glider AUV. And a um, couple of things that kind of popped popped here is that, I mean, one other thing that I have to remember, and that's something that Angelique said, it's like, it's not only that that this, um, um, these optical tools allows us, the, the, you know, this, this higher spatial and temporal understanding of the process is true, the, you know, the one that we have to be on but also gives us an idea of uncertainties. And, and uncertainties are really important. I think like, think about uncertainties makes us, and I consider myself observational oceanographer in a sense, from being doing the, you know, like art for art's, art's sake, so science for science sake, but also looking at the further implication of the work that we do. Uh, by having uncertainties, our observations are they much more applicable to the models that Blake is gonna be talking about, or, or you know, stuff that has to do with remote sensing um, that I also work with. And ultimately, um, these synthesis and developing the practices in, in part of the synthesis then allow further application to the program as uh, you know like go bcg and so on 
And then these ultimately lead to development of new technology. That new technology allows us new science. So it's a perpetuum mobile. So I think like, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago, these synthesis studies would not be possible. And and even like now with experts finishing up, I'm like looking back at it, like, like some of the data from, from like, you know, JGOFs, here's Atlantic Bloom experiment. I was like, oh, that's what happened. So it's really amazing. Um, it just, you know, like allows us to go back and see things in a different way. But um, there's also a set of questions that, um, you know, like uh, the, if you, Heather can go to the next slide that everybody put together and I, I prop some in this kind of combination of the, what the chairs were saying, what I was saying. Um, I think Angie kind of touched upon that stuff. Um, optical tools gives us raw information. Um, um, Kurt Mobley, when, very often when he talks about hydro life, he says garbage in, garbage out. And this is just kind of like garbage out. Um, and, and we have to be able to uh, differentiate garbage, you know, differentiate the noise and stuff, and really a lot about these optical tools and their capabilities in order to distinguish something that is associated with uncertainties just because the instrument is doing what it's doing and the natural data. And so we can have that science paper that we all want. So when I entered this field, I was partially in a sense unprepared to do everything what I need to do. Um, and the question is like, you know, are we training enough the future generations? Because, you know, we are relying so much on optics. So, you know, is ocean optics class in main enough? Um, you know, and there's IOCCG, like, you know, do, you know, what else are the things that we have to do? Inclusivity, and that's where both Amy and Angie and Angel mentioned. Um, you know, like this is, it's great that we have all these things and stuff. But if you look at these large field campaigns, it kind of falls under these scope of very rich countries and stuff. How do we improve this inclusivity? Is is the way to go towards that? Try to kind of like, you know, force our program managers to start thinking about joining forces with some other people and, and allowing funding to 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 go towards other countries. Um, and one thing that I kind of like, I was like, damn, I'm again talking about NABO8, you know, but the fact is it takes a really long time to get these synthesis papers out. Um, you know, like NABO8 was in 2008 and big papers started coming out in 2015 and this way past that three year funding cycle. How do we address that? What are we gonna do? You know, like uh, there's like so much great data, who's gonna work with that? Um, we need to think about that. I mean, I, I think that optics, you know, it's changed in the way the field's functioning and it's really bringing that painful thing back in front of our eyes that we have lots of data that we have never published because we just don't have the funding to do it. Anyways, um, that's uh, that's it for me. And I think next one is Joe, who's gonna take you in the field of satellite oceanography. Thanks, thanks. Do, do you have the slides you'll put up? Heather, we should still have the slides. I just started to stop talking because I thought that was a light line for me. To I think we lost Heather. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Heather. Bone and, and Angelique, I'm sorry I was coughing during your uh, talks there, but when I turn off my mic, I have to log back in. So I, I gave a very elementary um, uh, talk uh, about linking optical measurements from space to biogeochemical um, products. So I, I know that there's uh, several very knowledgeable people on, on board here. This was not the talk for you. Um, so so I, I talked a little bit about, okay, what do we get out of a uh, out of an ocean color sensor? And it's just radiance and dependent on the uh, water type and the, and the constituents within the water. We'll get a different spectra of those uh, of radiance. And so um, this is what is spit out of a uh, uh, out of a satellite ocean color sensor, but it's not that good because uh, we don't get a full spectra yet. Um, we we only get uh, parts of the spectra, and the parts of the spectra have been you know professionally considered to give us the maximum value from that ocean color sensor, but. Um, there's still uh, there's still a lot of gaps in what we could be learning if we had hyperspectral. So so we get these spectra. We want products. <clears throat> I've listed on the top left. <clears throat> excuse me. I've listed several listed several stocks there. We're getting better and better at getting at stocks, and we can also starting to get good at understanding particle size distribution and taxonomy through through understanding the inherent optical properties. Um, but when we get hyperspectral um, data, we should do much, much better at those uh, latter two that, that I mentioned. So one of the things that we still, even with PACE up, which will be a complete game changer, 
because it's got a really high signal to noise. It's hyperspectral. There's two polarimeters on it, which will tell us a lot about absorbing aerosols and, and uh, other aerosols that confound our atmospheric correction. Um, we still don't have the element of, of time. We still can't study fast process. And, and, and think about that for a minute, because one of the things that, uh, that we're, we're very interested in the community is rates, right? We're interested in, in, in primary productivity. You know, the, the rate at which carbon is, uh, is fixed by the phytoplankton community, net community production, respiration, calcification even. We might be able to understand these things from, from satellite, but we kind of have to guess at this time step because what we're dealing with is a snapshot. And so that was supposed to be a segue into what I know a little bit more about. Um, and what do, we, what do we get by adding the element of time to the hyperspectral data? So now we get to study fast uh, processes. So if we had hourly data, we would be able to um, you know, study this very profound geophysical signal, you know, the sun going up, going across the sky, going, going down, and its effects on the phytoplankton community, and, and they are profound. And so then that was a segue into um, a new ocean color mission that, that I'm leading with several others called, called Glimmer. And this is a hyperspectral radiometer that's in geostationary orbit, and we're going to be able to take hourly uh, data. So that was, that's the background of my talk. Could you switch that slide, pre please? And then, uh, so, so then from that, uh, Maria came up with some questions, which I, I agreed with, that we'll be talking about at the, at the breakout um, uh, table. And it, it's more about new satellite uh, missions, of which Glimmer is only one. And, and, you know, what are some of the novel products that, that you folks need that can be developed with satellite uh, missions? How do we integrate data sets and, and leverage these data sets and resources? And then what new satellite ocean color mission or ocean missions in general do we need to better quantify the movement of carbon through the marine ecosystem? And, uh, and that's that. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And our last speaker is Dr. Blake Clark, oceanographer and biogeomodeler at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, discussing integration of optics into biogeochemical models. Thanks, Maria. Um, and thanks, everybody. Yeah, so um, thanks, everybody, for coming today. I guess what I wanted to highlight with this slide um, is sort of the end of, of my talk, and I hope I hope you all got to watch it on, on the YouTube channel. Um, and it's focusing on sort of what's next in terms of uh, these global observations, whether it's floats uh, with, a, with the Go BGC program or um, hyperspectral observations from PACE, which will be coming online um, in 2023, hopefully. And then all of these observations that, um, that occur during field campaigns like exports that provide just a wealth of, of really high frequency, high quality optical data as well as associated biogeochemical measurements. Um, and integrating those into modeling systems that can predict similar things that we can measure and things that we can't measure from optics, such as, um, uh, or things that are, that are much more difficult to measure in situ, uh, such as the uh, gross primary production at any given point on Earth for any given time on Earth. And really how we can take these different um, tools whether they're in situ global observations or, or point observations from, from large field campaigns um, and incorporate them with models to get closer towards the truth, which is outlined in this bottom left-hand diagram from this IOSCCG or the International Ocean Color Coordinating Group report number 19, which was published last year. And, um, and how integrating these tools, whether it's through data assimilation of of remote sensing observations or in-situ observations into modeling systems or modeling systems predicting things that satellites can see such as uh, the hyperspectral ocean color, such as the NASA ocean biological model depicted in the bottom middle figure, um, how we can move towards the, uh, closer towards the, the, the true um, processes, whether it's the carb air sea carbon flux or export flux in the uh, global ocean um, in the past and then looking actually towards the, the future. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. 
So here are some questions that I came up with, and I think there's a couple more as well that will be um, um, in, in our table. Um, and so the first is, what are, conceptual, what are some conceptual or technical strategies to utilize the new in situ and upcoming orbital information in existing biogeochemical modeling architectures? So thinking more about um, how, uh, how, how the existing models can, can start incorporating some of this technology that's just coming online in the next uh, couple of years. And um, now thinking more from the modeling aspect, which is which is more of my background, is what, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of assimilating ocean color products, whether it's direct remote sensing reflectance or ocean color or derived products such as chlorophyll concentration or um, or DOC concentration or, or CDOT concentration. And then how can we utilize these coming hyperspectral capabilities, whether it's actually having the ability to predict the hyperspectral remote sensing reflectance globally using modeling systems, and how can that inform what we're seeing from space uh, through time? And then lastly, um, what are some important pathways that, that current models are missing or that are, that are poorly constrained? And I'm sure that the modelers out there can think of, of quite a few, um, whether it's you know the land ocean flux, which is primarily where I work, or, um, or how we even parameterize basic, basic things such as phytoplankton and growth. Um, how can they be improved by including this uh, optical information that, that folks like Angel and Ivona and, uh, and Joe provide um, to, to, to us modelers? And, um, and I guess with that, I'll pass it back to the hosts. Thank you and I look forward to going into breakout. Thank you, Blake, thank you so much. Okay, so how will the breakout discussion happen? Um, you will see there will be different tables you can join. It's focusing on uh, one of the four subtopics of our session, novel in situ bioptical technologies and data sets, community use of large campaign bioptical data, new ocean satellite missions, integration of optics in biogeochemical models. So please join the table you think you would like to contribute to or learn more about and participate in the discussion. Uh, different subtopics will be addressing different uh, questions, but across all topics, we're really interested to learn what you think are, first, the most important gaps. Uh, second, the most important uh, steps and challenges, maybe, for effective integration. Integration of data from different sensors, uh, integration of data from different field campaigns, integration of data from new satellite missions, the value of sets and integration can be much greater than the sum of its parts. So we're interested in your thoughts uh, on this. We also want your feedback on what you think are the most important areas for future investment. Maybe this would be uh, the low hanging fruits or this would be the craziest, but uh, also the most exciting, the high risk, high return ideas. Uh, our invited speakers will join tables to brainstorm with you. And for each table, please designate a person who would report back and communicate your answers to our whole group during the panel discussion. Also, please do not forget to use the whiteboards for your notes and answers. Here, we'd recommend taking a screenshot of your whiteboards uh, before leaving your table, and uh, you can drop it in the chat box as well. Uh, to summarize here, the objective with the breakouts is to discuss the questions we have for you and also additional questions that you feel are important to address and come up with some answers and maybe more important, some specific recommendations uh, for future work and future investment. We have program managers, we have program scientists from different agencies attending our meeting and discussing, interacting with us at OCB. This is our opportunity to highlight what our community needs to move forward and make even more progress in this really important uh, integration of optics and biogeochemistry. So with that, let's go to the breakouts.